So as I was preparing for this morning's message, I came across one or two interesting articles. Uh, researchers suggest that negative information, okay, negative Im information or negative events have a greater impact on us, on our brains, than positive uh, events or positive information. Let me give an example. If you get a $500 gift voucher, all right, of course you're happy. But if you, for some reason, lose $500, you know, somebody stole $500, you got fined $500 uh, for a traffic violation, the pain far outweigh, okay, far outweigh the pleasure, all right, of a similar uh, monetary value. Maybe for uh, students, you, you can identify with that. Uh, the pleasure of getting an A all right, is far less than the pain of getting a D, right? I don't know whether that makes sense. Let me repeat, you know, the pain of getting a D for your exam is far worse than getting an A for your exams. All right? So that, that's what researchers found out. And the suggested reason all right, uh, for this uh, experiencing negative events is because of the events pose a uh, possible danger. You know, our survival instinct where we have this adrenaline uh, rush that comes, you know, when we go through danger, this fight or flight sort of thing happening. Uh, so that's, that's one of the possible explanations. So psychologists suggest that the way to get out of depression or sadness or negativi negativity is to give thanks. Now, let me say this up front, I'm not a psychologist, I'm not trained in psychology, and you know, sometimes all these scientific uh, theories come and go, all right? But assuming that what uh, they are saying is correct, you know, it's amazing, isn't it, that science or psychology uh, is beginning to find out, you know, that um, the result of giving thanks has a, result, has a beneficial result on us human beings. Uh, so you may ask, what's this big deal that I'm talking about for Thanksgiving? Well, the Bible tells us that we need to be thankful. And so you, you see that, you know, in a way, uh, the world is beginning to find out, you know, when the Bible says something, there is truth. Now, we started this year with the theme of being rooted and built up in Christ. And our Theme verse, as, as it were, is taken from Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7. And let me just read that because it's so short, all right? And then um, I'll go on. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to walk or to live your lives in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness, overflowing with thankfulness. That's how verse 7 ends. Maybe it is providential as we come towards the end of this very short series, annual checkup, that the word thanksgiving is squarely, uh, smack squarely uh, in front of us. So here's my big idea. Um, my big idea is this, uh, that uh, as we approach thanks giving, it is good to ask, are we flowing with thankfulness? And I have very, three very simple points, you know, where are you now? What's your score? Uh, how can you be thankful? And why is it so important? At least from the scriptural or biblical perspective. So, why is it, or uh, what is our score? Where are you now? Now, the Bible tells us, as, if, as I've said in verse 7, overflowing in thankfulness. This idea of being thankful really is permeates through uh, the book of Colossians, right? Um, uh, in chapter 1, for example, the idea of thankfulness is never far from Paul's mind. He prays in verse 12 that the church of Colossae or in Colossae may live in a way worthy of Christ. He prays that they may be strengthened, that they may joyfully give thanks to the Father. 
In another part of the Bible, in the first letter to the church in Thessalonica, uh, Paul is even more emphatic. In fact, uh, if you read, he says here, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, giving thanks in all circumstances. The three verbs, actually, Paul wrote those verbs in the imperative. It's a command. It's not like, oh, I think it's a good idea to rejoice. Uh, you know, let me suggest that you pray, and why don't you try to be thankful? No, Paul is giving a command. Rejoice, pray, and give thanks in all circumstances, whether even if, whether you are suffering, whether you are not happy, whether you are going through pain, Paul commands that we rejoice. I have some questions in terms of challenge. You know, I come from a tradition, I suppose, uh, where, you know, I don't have this habit, right? Um, I don't know, I was not brought, raised up in America, so Thanksgiving is, as a holiday, is alien to me. So, you know, when I attend Thanksgiving dinner, initially, they say, oh, well, you know, we sit around the table, we say, hey, what are you thankful for? They say, I saw a cringe, you know. You know, I, I don't have that tradition, you know. Or, or you know, uh, maybe for me, it's upbringing, um, it's cultural, you know, when people are invited to our house, you know, my father would say, oh, I'm sorry, we didn't, prepare enough food or, you know, and my mother used to slave for hours, you know, preparing, say, oh yeah, I'm sorry, not that great food, you know. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's upbringing. Oh, you know, when we have children and then they receive a gift, you know, then the children just take it and then what do you say as mother usually? What do you say? Right? Thank you, right? So it's, it's almost like it's alien to us. Maybe we're facing financial challenges. Maybe our work uh, have pressure, relationship issues that uh, we are facing, or disappointment in school. Disappointment in school. Do you doubt the faithfulness of God? Maybe all these things cause you to be in a foul mood. Maybe you're part of the 47.6 or 7 percent of people who voted for you know, uh, Hillary Clinton. And Thanksgiving, you know, you know that there are some people you don't like who... Uh, vote for the other party, you know, and to spend Thanksgiving for them gloating over you. You know, it's something that you do not look forward to. So where are you? What's your score? Now, the next point uh, in, by way of an answer is how can you be more thankful? And I suggest that we go to the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms is actually a hymn book of the nation in Israel and also for us. Uh, the Psalms actually are, uh, are written by people uh, who are going through a whole host of emotions, sadness or lament, uh, praise. They're thankful. Or it's a psalm of uh, deep concern, but yet the determination to, be tr to trust God, it's a hymn of trust a desire for justice, and so on. And so, go to the thanksgiving psalm. 65 is one of them. And remember this. At the back of your mind, you may say to yourself, how can I be thankful when I don't feel like it? How can I be thankful when I'm going through so much problems? You see, the psalm, Psalm 65 especially, or there are many psalms who are communally thanksgiving psalms. You come to church, maybe you're not in that mood of thankfulness, but then you are told that you are to give thanks. It is an act of intention. There is intentionality there. It is a corporate call to be thankful. So it begins in verse 1. Praise awaits you, O God, in Zion. Maybe you can substitute in Hawk 5. All right? Praise awaits you, O God, in Hawk 5. To you, our vows will be fulfilled. It's a, it's a call to be intentionally thankful. And the psalmist gives three reasons. Or I, I'm sort of paraphrasing into three reasons. Number one, he hears our prayers. 
We see that in verse 2. O you who hear prayer, to all men, to you all men will come. Time and again, the book of Psalms tells us that God is the person who hears our prayers in the midst of sorrow. I sought the Lord and God answered. He rescues me from all that terrified me. Psalm 34. Oh, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry. Psalm 40. See, one of the frightening aspects in life is that we are often tempted to look at life as though we are facing some impersonal force like fate. You know, uh, you, you, you can't do anything about it. So you, you try and use all your power just to, to make sure that the situation is um, okay for you. But a lot of us, you know, we say we come to church, we are Christians. But in practice, we are atheists. In other words, we, we don't go to God, we trust in ourselves. The book of Psalm, at least Psalm 65, tells us a different picture. We can go to God. Next, we read in verse 3, He forgives our sins. We are overwhelmed by sins. You forgave our transgression. Now, to the Hebrew mind, people, uh, they all know that sin and transgression, these are words that we don't hear nowadays. But when there is sin, when there's transgression, relationship, our relationship with God is broken. So when God forgives, that relationship is restored. You know, they are cool again, as it were. And so the bottom line of this restored relationship is that you can, you can come into the presence of God. You can dwell in the temple, all right? You can enjoy it. And so we read it in verse 5. They live in a court and enjoy God's favor. We're not, God is not angry with us anymore because of what Jesus Christ has done. And as we look at that in the New Testament context, because of Christ's death on the cross, our relationship with God is restored. Very quickly, we move on. We are thankful to God, not only because He hears our prayers, not only because He forgives our sins, but because he is so good. And I'm sort of paraphrasing because of time from verses 5 to the end of the psalm. You see, God is good because of his awesome deeds. We read that in verse 5. You know, we see that people around, in fact, the nations around the ends of the earth, we read in verse 9, see the awesome acts of God, God's righteous acts. And clearly to the people of Israel as they were thinking about this psalm is that God saved the nation of Israel from her enemies. The same God who formed the mountains, the same God who stilled the waters. And finally from verses 9 and following, um, the psalmist talks about God's goodness. All right? When there is drought, God nourishes the land. All right, he fills the earth with the bounty of harvest. He is awesome and he blesses us. He is so good. So I want to sort of bring to your attention or emphasize to you this morning. The psalm is, at least 65, is a corporate psalm of thanksgiving. We may come right in a mood that is sad, depressed, or foul because of things that are happen. But we are reminded, like our parents, as parents we remind our children, when you receive things from people, what do you say? Thank you. And so as we think about the reasons why we are thankful, He forgives us, He hears our prayers, He's so good, we say, thank you, God. We are reminded of God. It is an act of intention. You don't be thankful because you feel like it, you are thankful because you are reminded that we need to be thankful. So that sort of provides me a segue into the third reason. Why do you think, why does the Bible tell us that we need to be thankful? Why is it that we need to rejoice, we need to pray, and we need to give thanks in all circumstances? Because when it is so unnatural, 
All right, when things are tough and you don't feel like thankful, when the Bible calls you, commands you to do something that is, quote, unnatural, unquote, it forces you to look seriously and force yourself to look at God and say, God, I know you are sovereign because the psalmist tells us your awesome deed is seen by everyone. He is so mighty, even from afar. He answers my prayers. He forgives me. He restores relationship. We are forced to look at that. And so if all these things, if all these premises are correct, and if bad things happen, then I must trust that God allows this for my own good. And even if I still am in pain until the rest of my life is over, I am confident that it is for my good. That's the reason. And when you do that, two things happen. Two things happen. Number one, God is glorified. God is glorified. We see the goodness of God in display and we are reminded of His goodness. See, sometimes people say, oh, God is like a ego, is on an ego trip. He's a megalomania. Because, you know, how can you say you need to glorify me? Because God knows that only when we glorify Him will He not disappoint us. There is nothing greater than He Himself that's worthy of, of, of being glorified. To say, oh, yeah, it's not me, you know, that's false humility. And in fact, you will tell people, you give people the impression that they are glorifying the wrong thing. Only God is worthy of glorification. And in the process, in the process of glorifying God, we are changed. We are changed. Let me, let me share an illustration from history. Okay? Um, in 1938, I think all of you were not born in 1938. Uh, in 1938, there was a person, a British a guy. Um, his name is Nicholas Winton. Actually, Nicholas planned to go to Switzerland for a ski trip. He was quite wealthy. But instead, for some reasons, he ended up in Czechoslovakia, right? Right now we call that the Czech Republic because you know the nation sort of split it into two. Now at that time, at that time the Nazis, Nazi Germany, had just seized Sudetenland. Let me just give you a map of Sudetenland. Uh, you notice that Germany is the one in uh, in brown or in chocolate color. And then on its right, uh, on the west part, is Czechoslovakia at that time. And the part where the arrow is, is called Sudetenland. Now that part of, of Czechoslovakia is inhabited by many German-speaking Czechs. Okay? German-speaking Czechs. So Hitler at that time sort of swallowed that up, seized Germany. And then at that time, if you're familiar with her world history, the British uh, and the French, they were so shell-shocked from the First World War, all right? Uh, millions died, so they were sort of saying, hey, you know, let's, let's appease Germany and hope that, you know, he will stop, all right? The, the policy of appeasement. Uh, uh, so, so at that time, Germany seized the Sudetenland. And uh, Nicholas went, for some reasons, uh, you can Google his name, uh, to Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia, and he saw in Prague, the capital of Prague, a beautiful place. We were there a couple of years ago. Uh, the, 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 the extreme plight of children uh, who were there. And, um, uh, and then he came back to England. And now, if again, just by way of background, a month earlier, uh, in, in Germany, there was this event called the Kristallnacht, you know, the Night of uh, Crystal, you know, where mobs, uh, Nazi thugs, as it were, they went around in, uh, in Germany, they broke the glasses of the shops, all right, uh, of Jewish people. So the Kristallnacht, the Night uh, of Crystals, I, I suppose, glass. And so the British Parliament uh, permitted 
uh, so-called children refugees or refugee children from uh, Czech Republic to come to England, provided they can uh, pay for their own, um, their own fare, uh, train fare and, and ship, and provided there is a family who is willing to adopt them, and provided they, they can uh, raise 50 pounds, uh, sort of, you know, a guarantee that they will return when everything is over. 50 pounds, I sort of Google it, is worth 2,900 US dollars now. So when Nicholas Winton went back to England, he organized kids coming over to England. In fact, over the year, he found adoptive parents, he secured entry permits, raised funds to cover, and if he couldn't find enough money, he used his own money. And he was able to organize eight train loads of children from Czech uh, Republic or Czechoslovakia to England, and uh, they totaled 669 children came to England safely. Um, and when uh, he organized the ninth train, unfortunately, it was stopped. And the 250 children were stopped. And uh, we found out later on that of the 250, only two survived the German concentration camps. All the parents, we believe, were dead. After the war, Winton sort of kept this thing secret. Uh, but in 1988, his wife accidentally discovered the scrapbook, scrapbook where he had all the families, all the names, and all the details that contains the name and paperwork, and there was a reunion. You know, when your life is saved, a lot of things in the world is not important after all. Isn't it true? When we thank God, it ennobles us. It raises us up. I don't know about you, but I'm not the same person anymore. I want to be a blessing to other people. I want to touch their lives just as Winston or Winton touched the lives of people. And when you touch the lives of people, that's where you find fulfillment, isn't it? The challenge is, how can we do so? Well, I have two very specific recommendations. I mean, there are many things you can do. All right, there are people who are hungry, right? If you have no plans as you shop, buy some stuff, bring it to church. Every time I go to the supermarket now, I'm greeted by people who say, oh, can you contribute to some food banks? You know, do something. In the book of Leviticus, we read, you know, uh, God is a God who commands the farmers, all right, not to till the land until everything is exploited, everything is harvested. God commands that they are to leave some of the corn out in the field so that the poor, you know, have the dignity to, to come and harvest uh, and not just to get a handout, but to harvest, to work for something that they do not have. And you have the second harvest, an right, organization with the same spirit. Uh, we just talked about this uh, FX. It's a co-sponsorship between the English congregation and the children's ministry. Uh, we hope as many of you who have young children can come, but there is a need for volunteers between 6 to 8, I mean, between 4 o'clock, come and help set up the uh, places and um, do certain things so that you can help people build a Christmas tradition. Christmas tradition so that they, you know, they, they, they can firm up. They can make Christmas, Christianity more meaningful to them. It's not just fun, but it's to help people uh, build and create family traditions that when the children grow up, they can look back fondly and say, oh yeah, that's what I always do uh, around Christmas. When we think how we can bless other people, we, we are less likely to fixate on our problems. 
You know, many years ago, and I've told this story, if you remember this story, you know, just, just bear with me. Uh, many years ago, we, we traveled, all right? My, my, my family traveled. Uh, we were living in Philadelphia. We traveled to see our parent in, uh, my parents-in-law. Uh, we used Amtrak. So we, we came back, to, we came back to, uh, to Amtrak Station in Philadelphia, 30th Street Station. Uh, after, what, 16, 17 hours of, you know, being on the train, uh, it's no fun. So we were sort of very tired and, and then we, we were, I was gra grabbing the, the luggage, my wife was grabbing the two children and one of our kids just dropped <laughs> into the, the real track. I think you remember the story, right? The gap, actually, uh, Amtrak station is actually, uh, from the train the station is actually about one foot and something. You know, a kid can just drop into, so one of my kids just dropped in and we were shocked, right? Like, uh, we see the whole thing in slow motion. Anyway, uh, a, a conductor was quick enough to open the trap door, go down and retrieve my child. And then, um, uh, when we were hugging the person, and I, I'm not mentioning who, right? So, because it's taped. Uh, you know, when my children are grown up, I don't think they like to be uh, mentioned. Anyway, so the, the person say, you know, you know the, instead of being thankful, you know what the child say? Pillow, pillow, <laughs> pillow, you know, because uh, the favorite uh, Sesame Street pillow was left on the track. So, you know, you know, pillow, pillow. So fortunately, the guy was kind of go down <laughs> again. <laughs> you know, when, when you've been saved, you know, you fixate on things that are not important. Sometimes we are like that, isn't it? God just saved us and, oh, pillow, I want a pillow. When you've been saved, you know, you don't fixate on the things that I've just enumerated that bothers you. You know, last week there was, um, there was a, uh, something that happened. Um, I was asking uh, for reimbursement from uh, uh, the city of San Jose, you know, and the city came back and said, oh, re we reject your claim, you know. Uh, for some sort of bureaucratic reason, I was furious, I suppose. But then, you know, I'll, start, I'll say it to myself, you know, do you want to spend your life fighting over things when, I mean, it's some money, but, or do you just say, well, uh, you need wisdom to decide what you want to fight, the things that are important to you and the things that are not important. I think it's the same thing too. There, there will be many, many things you get upset over in life. Some of them are very important, which I, I sh I'm sure out of your conviction you should fight. But there are other things that you need wisdom to decide. You know, you just let go. So that's my, that's my so-called, uh, the way God spoke to me last week. So what's your score this Thanksgiving? What's your score? Where do you stand? Are you... Angry, depressed, frustrated, disappointed, sorrowful. The whole range, the whole gamut of negativity, negative emotions sort of brings you down. It's natural, our flesh. And then you are reminded by scripture, give thanks in all circumstances. You say, this is unreal, man. But the Bible tells us that. Then the Bible tells us, go to Scripture. Think of the Psalms, Thanksgiving Psalms. Psalm 65 this morning. Remember the big picture. God answers our prayers. He forgives us. He restores us. He's so good. Look at his wonderful, awesome deeds that were seen by Israel. Think about Ebenezer, the stone of remembrance. The things that God has blessed you in life. And all the blessings that God has. He nourishes the world. California in a drought. He brings rain. 
He gives us good harvests. There may be seasons of drought, yes. He's so good. He saved us. Do we fixate on the pillows, the Sesame Street pillows in our life and forget how life can be so much of a blessing? So what do we do? We glorify God. We ask for ways and means that will ennoble us to make our lives meaningful and to be a blessing to other people. What are you going to do about this? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for what you have done, for who you are. Yes, we are thankful for the emotional um, YouTube that forces us into thinking, wow, some people just got away with their lives and they are so thankful. May we also have the same attitude. Lord, I know for myself, being thankful is a habit that I do not possess. But I thank you, God, that you remind us in Scripture to do so again. May we respond appropriately so that you will be glorified. For we ask in Jesus' name.